My name is yeah. Amy Pollock. I'm a cardiologist here at the Mayo Clinic. I work in our vascular medicine section, and I spend time in our thrombophilia clinic where I work with Dr. Rob McBain. And my name is Rob McBain. I'm uh, also within the cardiovascular division, and I uh, work in the vascular center, and specifically in the thrombophilia clinic. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the new guidelines that were published in February of 2012. Uh, these are the um, uh, these are the uh, ACCP guidelines, and they're specifically related to uh, thrombotic disorders and anticoagulation related issues. And so. Uh, our task today is to talk about these new uh, guidelines and, and to introduce uh, a study that we have, a manuscript that we've recently uh, will be publishing entitled A Succinct Review of the New Venous Thromboembolism Prevention and Management Guidelines. Um, so tell me, uh, uh, Amy, what, uh, what, why, why, would, uh, why would somebody want to read this article? You know, Rob, I think that's it's a great question. When, when you and I were um, uh, approached to, to write this article, in thinking about the best material to provide to our colleagues, what could we add to the new guidelines? Why was this article relevant to our colleagues? I, I think it's really two things that we offer. You know, number one, the executive summary provided by the guidelines is, uh, is pretty dense and um, can be hard to digest, particularly at the point of care when you're trying to make clinically relevant decisions for your patients. And as you know, it, it's based on 21 supporting articles. And these expert panels uh, came together and looked at all the available evidence and gave the medical evidence in the literature a grading from A, strong, to C, weak. And then based on that evidence, provided a recommendation for all of the different topics which we discuss, diagnosis, um, management, and prevention of venous thromboembolism. And I think that our article does really two things. One, we provide a concise, easily digestible overview of what's involved in the executive summary and really the whole guidelines. Uh, and then number two, we comment specifically on some controversial areas. And furthermore, when you have those grade two level C recommendations where it's a weak recommendation based on pretty weak evidence. I think that that's really an area where our colleagues and myself in particular have had a hard time knowing what should I do with this? Where should I take this? And we aim to try to address some of those more controversial areas based on our understanding of the literature as well as the clinical practice in our thrombophilia clinic. Thanks. That's exactly why you should read this article. It's, uh, and it really summarizes nicely uh, what, how, not only the, the, the current guidelines, but how we interpret the guidelines and what our clinical practice is. Well, this, this, um, this uh, in, entire manuscript is devoted uh, to venous thromboembolism. Is that a relevant topic for our readers? I think it's a relevant topic for anyone, regardless of your specialty, surgical versus medical, primarily outpatient or, in, or inpatient. I think there's tremendous intersect with, with all fields. Uh, and, and we aim at, at addressing whether or not it's the treatment, diagnosis, or prevention of venous thromboembolism. And comment specifically on things such as an, uh, an isolated distal deep venous thrombosis and what do you do with that? You know, can you just follow somebody conservatively with serial ultrasounds or who are the patients where you, they really might benefit from starting on anticoagulation initially? And we also talk about um, patients who are pregnant or are planning to become pregnant who may be at risk for venous thromboembolism. That's a very difficult population to know what's the best combination of risk versus benefit, both to the mom and, and to the fetus. So those are some of the, the areas. So I, th I think it's really relevant to a wide spectrum of practitioners. I think one of the, one of the key items is uh, that there are points in the guidelines where we, we uh, disagree with the guidelines. and. Uh, and in those uh, cases, we have uh, pointed out to what our practice patterns are here at, uh, at Mayo Clinic and our thrombophilia clinic. And, and I must admit that there are some where we have, um, we have uh, differed a bit with the guidelines. And so we provide those insights into, into each of these, uh, into each of these, uh, these characters and these specific questions. And one other area that we address that I think is really relevant, relevant <coughs> would be the dosing of low molecular weight heparin such as anoxaparin. The guidelines mention this specifically that if it, anoxaparin um, is going to be used once daily dosing, then the dose should be two milligrams per kilogram. Traditionally, uh, anoxaparin has been given one milligram per kilogram every 12 hours. And based on um, some uh, supporting trials from similar drugs, 
the dose that many practitioners use is for a once daily conversion would be 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. And this is a very controversial topic that we face in, in our practice and I know our colleagues do and, and we go into great detail about why do the guidelines come out with this two milligrams per kilogram for once daily dosing? Uh, when are the patients that you should just really say, gosh, I think we need to use it twice a day with the standard dose? And, and when could you consider doing a 1.5 milligram per kilogram dose? Because it, it really is um, very important in select patients, particularly those who are at high risk for venous thromboembolism, such as antiphospholipid antibody patients. Mm -hmm. If you're using an inadequate dose and they're having subsequent events, then it's not a treatment failure, it's, it's an inadequate dose. So I think it's important to be well versed and, and those nuances of something as seemingly simple as the dosing of an oxaparin. Mm -hmm. And along that line, we also discuss what to do with uh, cancer patients who have had uh, venous thromboembolism and may have failed the mm -hmm. guidelines, which is uh, low molecular heparin, and how to approach those. And then, uh, as the as the antithrombotic experience is evolving, we also talk about the novel anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. And although they were not given a strong recommendation by the guidelines, uh, clinical practices certainly, including an increasing use of, uh, for example, rivaroxaban in, in, in the setting of venous thrombosis, we discussed those issues. So I think for these, uh, all of the, for, for all of these reasons, uh, I think that our manuscript is worthy of reading and hopefully uh, the concise nature of the review as opposed to reading <laughs> the New York phone book, uh, which is the original document, I think will be helpful for clinicians. So enjoy. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.com. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.